Do you ever wonder what would happen if all the mysteries of the universe were suddenly revealed to you? On the surface, it might seem like an interesting concept, but in reality, probably none of us could handle the weight that that knowledge would entail. In today's story, I'm going to tell you about a mystery so horrifying that it's probably best we'll never know the full truth behind it. In the winter of 1958, a group of 10 students from the Ural Polytech Institute in the Soviet Union set on a very difficult hiking trip through the mountains. All of the hikers in this group were very accomplished in their field, they were all grade 2 certified, and the completion of this trip that they were planning would ensure that each of them earned their grade 3 certificate, and this was the highest hiking distinction in the Soviet Union at the time, so this was a really important trip for everyone. The grade 3 certification requires that each hiker in the group complete a trip of at least 186 miles over at least 16 days, with half of those days being in uninhabited regions. The trip that they were planning more than covered all of these requirements, in fact it was quite a lot more difficult than they actually needed it to be, but each of them wanted to prove themselves against the elements. Everyone in the group was so desperate to achieve this grade 3 certification because this would allow them to teach hiking at a university level and this was a huge career goal, a milestone for each of them. They each studied different things when they were in school, but hiking was their true passion and they wanted to be able to make a living doing it. Now it was typical back in those days for hiking groups to bring along lots of cigarettes and booze and other things to spice things up, but this trip was so serious for everyone that they didn't bring any of that for this trip. They just wanted to focus on the task at hand. The goal of this trip was to reach the mountain of Gora Orton through a 300 mile extremely difficult mountain path that was rated as the highest difficulty of any hiking path in the entire Soviet Union. But in spite of this monumental challenge that lay in store for each member of this hiking group, they were all very confident, they were young and in great shape, and they just knew in their head that they would find a way through this and earn this certification. It didn't really bother any of them, they were just excited to face the challenge. On January 25th, 1959, the group traveled by train to a remote village in the northern Soviet Union. After a much needed day of rest and recovery, they began their trip up the mountain on foot on the 27th of January. Shortly after they left the village though, one of the members of the group, 21 year old Yuri Yudin, began suffering from very mysterious joint pain. He tried to tough it out for a couple hours, but with a history of health issues, he decided after a while that he was just going to slow the group down, so he made the very difficult decision to return back to the village. Yudin didn't know it at the time, but that decision in hindsight actually saved his life. This left the group now with seven men and two women. A man named Igor Dyatlov was the leader of the group. He was a confident radio engineer and just a natural leader. He had a confidence and a charisma that was infectious to everyone around him. After Yudin had left the group, the nine of them continued on into what has become known as Dyatlov Pass, of course named after Igor. But they were hit by a very intense winter blizzard and this pushed them off course into an area that's become known as Dead Mountain. With the weather so bad, Dyatlov made the obvious decision to settle down for the night. They set up their tents, hunkered down, and hoped that the morning would bring them better weather. The group settled down around 5.30pm and they were all very eager just to get a few hours rest. Now whatever occurred over the next several hours is still shrouded in mystery, and it's become known as the Dyatlov Pass incident. Before Yuri Yudin left the group because of this joint pain, Dyatlov told him that he would send a telegram when they'd completed the journey, just so that Yudin knew that everything was okay, and he could kind of share in this success a little bit, even though he wouldn't have been there for the achievement. The journey was expected to take 16 days because this is the requirement that they needed to hit for this grade 3 certification, but Dyatlov expected it might take a few more days. In fact, he told Yudin that it could take up to 22 days. So Yudin didn't become too concerned at first after a couple weeks when he hadn't heard anything, but when it hit the 24th day, he started to become very concerned and he reported the group as missing. A rescue mission comprised of family members, professors at the Ural Polytech Institute, and other volunteers was quickly organized and they set out in search of the missing hikers. 
They combed through the mountain for days, and just when they were starting to lose hope and thinking about heading back, they saw a small speck on the horizon. They quickly pursued this speck, and as they got closer, they realized that it was the collapsed tent of their comrades. Now inside the tent was littered with clothing and other personal belongings, but to their relief, there was no bodies inside. Upon this discovery, they actually began to cautiously celebrate. If they hadn't found any dead bodies, then maybe their friends were still alive somewhere on the mountain. But everyone in the party couldn't help but thinking something about this scene seemed awfully strange. For one, there was this giant gash cut in the tent that had appeared to be cut from the inside. They of course didn't know it at the time, but the rescuers were just beginning to unravel a mystery that would become one of the strangest cases in all of history. The first thing that became obvious was that something must have terrified the hikers for them to cut open their tent and run outside with many of them not being fully dressed, right? Because a lot of the clothing was left behind inside the tent. But in spite of this bizarre scene, the rescuers remained optimistic. They'd found the tent, they'd found footprints, now the only thing left to find was the hikers themselves. But as they examined the footprints, things started to get even stranger. Rather than being sporadic as if they were running away from something, they were very orderly and single file at a walking pace. And even weirder, some of them appeared to be barefoot. Why on earth would you go into such conditions without having your winter boots on? It seems unfathomable. Early that morning, as they followed the footprints, it led them to a large spruce tree with many of the bottom branches broken off, the remains of a fire, and something brown that they couldn't distinguish sticking up out of the snow. As they walked closer and started to examine, they realized with a sickening feeling in their stomach that that brown thing sticking out of the snow was the remains of one of the hikers, Yuri Doroshenko. Yuri was found in just a t-shirt and his underwear. He was covered in blood and he had this strange grey fluid bubbling out of his mouth and his body was covered in burn marks. That grey fluid coming out of his mouth is usually a good indication that someone has suffered intense chest trauma. So either Doroshenko had fallen down from a great height or someone or something had pushed down on his chest to create these injuries. Now despite all these bizarre clues, the official cause of Doroshenko's death was listed as hypothermia. And that weird grey liquid coming out of his mouth, well, that never made it onto the official report. Yuri Krivonoshenko was found next to Doroshenko, and he too was wearing just a t-shirt and one sock on one of his feet. His body was covered in weird bruising, he had burn marks on his head, and a piece of his knuckle was found inside his mouth. The investigators figured that near the end he'd bitten down on his knuckle in order to stop himself from crying or to stay awake, they just didn't know which it was. It was later found in the investigation too that both of these bodies appeared to move, so perhaps they had died and then the other hikers had moved them into an orderly fashion under this spruce tree just out of respect. Then it's possible that after they had died the others had taken the warm clothes off of their body and kept them for themselves in a desperate attempt to fight the elements. Igor Dyatlov, the respected leader of the group, was the next to be found about 300 meters down the slope from the spruce tree. He was discovered lying face up in the snow. It was a frightening scene with both of his fists clenched hard. He had bruising on both of his ankles of all places and his jaw was also broken. The coroner reported that these injuries indicated that Dyatlov had been in some type of struggle, perhaps a fist fight, but again, the official cause of death was listed as hypothermia. Zenaida Kolomagrova was the first woman of the group to be found. Zenaida was a very attractive young woman, she was outgoing, and this personality made her welcomed by anyone who she hung out with. After the fact, many of her male peers admitted to secretly having a crush on her as well. She was found better dressed than the first three people, but strangely, the right sleeve of the sweater she was wearing had been torn off and revealed her bare skin. She also had intense bruising all over her body. The coroner also determined that she had not been sexually active, so this ruled out the possibility of a conflict due to that among some of the male members of the group. Now in spite of the horror of finding these bodies, the rescuers plunged on just praying that they might find someone from the group still alive. After a week of nothing, the next body was discovered. 
Rustem Slobodin was found face down in the snow. He had internal bleeding in both of his temples and a severe fracture on the top of his skull. Slobodin was a very talented musician and always brought a mandolin on any excursion that he went on. He was the son of wealthy university professors and he himself had already earned a degree in mechanical engineering. We still don't know what caused these head injuries, but doctors estimated that Slobodin had actually survived for at least an hour after they occurred, which is even more horrifying to think about. They guessed that Slobodin had become disoriented due to the injuries, wandered around for a while, and eventually collapsed in the snow before hypothermia finally did him in. The team kept searching for several weeks, but after they'd found nothing, they made the very difficult decision to turn around and head back into civilization. Months went by before a member of a local Mansi tribe who lived in that area of the mountains found a den that had been built by the remaining hikers in a desperate attempt to stay warm. Ludmila Dubanina was the first one to be found. The youngest member of the group, Dubanina, was a fervent communist, but she had this witty nature that really lightened up the group. Her body was found draped over a ledge with a stream running right beside it. Very disturbingly, her lips, eyeballs, and tongue were missing, with ten of her ribs shattered. But even more disturbing than this, like Slobodin, it was estimated that she had survived for a long period of time after the injuries had been sustained. Her official cause of death was listed as hemorrhaging of the heart, and this actually made her the only member of the group who had a listed death that was not hypothermia. Simeon Zolotorov was the next one in the group found. At 37 years old, he was far and away the oldest of the group, but he was a very experienced, dedicated hiker. He'd also seen intense action on the Russian front during World War II. He was something of a stranger to the group because he had joined this expedition at the last minute, but due to his outgoing personality, just a few days into the trip, he had already warmed up to the rest of the group. He was also the only member of the group who had already achieved his grade 3 certificate, so this made him highly respected by everyone else. He was one of the best dressed in the group, but he too had shattered ribs, head injuries, and he was missing his eyeballs and other soft tissue around his face. Very hauntingly too, he was found with a pen and paper in his hands, but he had died before he could write anything down. Alexander Kolvatov was found near the den. His body also showed signs of struggle with a broken nose, a shattered skull, and gashes behind both of his ears. His official cause of death was also listed as hypothermia, but the details of his injuries were incredibly vague on the official report. Nikolai Brignoli was found well prepared for the cold like Zalatoriev. It's believed that the two of them were already outside the tent when the rest of the group fled, which would explain why they were better prepared. Brignoli was found with internal bleeding in his forearm, and also a shattered skull, but weirdly, the soft tissue on his head was not damaged, it was just the bone itself that was broken. Now, the injuries of the nine hikers are both suspicious and incredibly shocking, and what's more is they don't really point towards hypothermia as being the primary cause of death. Based on the evidence on the scene, investigators have been able to put together a rough story of what might have happened that night. Analysis on the fibers of the tent confirmed that it had in fact been cut open from the inside, and the zipper of the tent was still locked in place, so all members of the group had exited through this hole that they'd cut, and since they left their belongings in place, they clearly had left in a big hurry. The first few footprints outside of the tent do look disorganized. The paths come away, but then they later come back together about a hundred yards down the slope, and from that point on, they're very orderly at a walking pace. At the tree line, Doroshenko and Krivonashenko began to suffer from hypothermia since they were the worst dressed of the group, so they started a fire and huddled around it in an attempt to stay warm. It's believed that at some point someone climbed up the spruce tree, which would explain why so many of the branches were broken, in order to get a better vantage point of the area and maybe scout out if it was safe to return to the tent. And then, after determining that it was safe, three hikers went back towards the tent, probably to bring back provisions, with the remaining four staying with Krivonashenko and Doroshenko just to take care of them. Dyatlov, Slobodin, and Kalamagrova all died while walking towards the tent at various stages of that walk. 
Doroshenko and Kravonoshenko likely died shortly thereafter, and with no sign of the three coming back from the tent, the remaining four members traveled further into the woods in an effort to protect themselves from the winter blizzard. At this point, they likely fell into a deep ravine, or maybe they were crushed by a drift of snow and ice, and this killed them. All nine members of the hiking group now lay dead or dying on the slopes of the mountain. Now this sounds like a reasonable theory, right? But the question on everyone's mind is, what on earth could have possibly possessed them to cut open their tent and leave? The tent, after all, was their only protection against the harsh weather outside, so something must have terrified them horribly. And further to that point, what on earth could have caused those horrific injuries? But there's something even more mysterious than the injuries themselves. As investigators searched the area and examined the bodies, they found a notable amount of radiation on both the clothes of the hikers and in the entire area of the Dyatlov Pass. There's never been an official explanation published as to how the radiation might have gotten there. Now, the incident has garnered widespread attention over the years, and thousands of theories have been put forth as to what might have happened. I'm going to take you through some of the more popular ones. One of the earliest theories put forth was that the hikers were killed by the local Mansi people. Now, as I mentioned, this storm had pushed them off course into an area that's become known as Dead Mountain. Dead Mountain has been sacred Mansi land for hundreds of years, so maybe in a retaliatory move, the Mansi people killed the hikers for trespassing on their land. This would explain why they left the tent so quickly, and the single file orderly way that they seemed to walk away, as if they were being led by someone. But the problems start to come up when you start to examine the injuries. Soviet doctors determined that the bone fractures, mainly on the skull and the ribs, could not have possibly be caused by humans. There was just too much force involved. So the Mansi people couldn't have killed them that way. Besides that, there were no other footprints or any indication that Mansi people had been in the area. Sure, they could have tried to cover up their tracks a little bit, but you still would expect to find some kind of sign that they had been there. While this theory gained popularity early, by the 1970s it was determined to be a cop out answer and it was never seriously considered from that point on. Another theory that has come up more recently is that an avalanche actually killed the hikers. They were after all camping in their tent on the side of a mountain in an area that was known for avalanches. This would explain why they left their tent in a hurry, but it still doesn't explain the injuries. It can explain the broken bones, sure, but if you remember, the coroner found that in a lot of the cases with the head injuries, there was no soft tissue damage, it was just the bone itself. If an avalanche had come down and buried the hikers and thrown them against a tree or a rock, you better believe that there would be a lot of soft tissue damage in addition to the broken bones. But in spite of all that, there was no real evidence that an avalanche had actually occurred in the area. Maybe the hikers thought an avalanche was coming, like they heard some kind of noise and this frightened them and sent them out of the tent, but this still doesn't explain how they died in such a horrific way. With the incredibly strange nature of the Dyatlov Pass incident, some have looked beyond just the natural phenomena and into the supernatural in order to explain things. One such theory is that a strange, unknown creature, maybe something like a yeti, took issue with the hikers on their land and killed them in retaliation. Now, I know this one's a little bit far-fetched, but it would explain the very strange injuries that the hikers sustained. But without any yeti-like footprints in the area, it kind of rules things out, right? You could make the argument that the Mansi people would have enough brains to be able to cover their tracks, but I have a hard time believing that a wild animal would be able to do the same, and why would they anyway? To be honest, I wouldn't have even mentioned this theory had it not been for a very strange photo that was found on the camera of one of the hikers. The photo the photo shows some type of bipedal creature. I guess it could just be a human without any clothes on, but if you look really closely, it doesn't quite look like a human, does it? The photo has been analyzed many times and it's been proven to be 100% authentic. But despite this haunting image, without any animal footprints and with no reasonable explanation for how the radiation got there, I have a hard time believing that a yeti or some other wild animal was involved in this incident. In order to explain the radiation, some people have pushed this supernatural theory a little bit further. Around the time when these hikers set off, local Mansi people reported seeing strange light 
lights in the sky in the area over Dead Mountain. One of the hiker's cameras was found with severe water damage, but after some time, many of the photos on it were eventually recovered. The photos appear to show strange things in the sky, as if the hiker saw them and wanted to document them. Of course, these lights in the sky could have just been caused by the water damage in the camera, but combined with the Mansi testimonies, it does become a bit more of a compelling argument. On top of all this evidence, the lead investigator of the case, his name was Lev Ivanov, said that many years later, the Soviet government had pressured him hard to keep anything like extraterrestrials or aliens out of his final report. Something particularly interesting that didn't make it into this report was the fact that there was burn marks found on top of those spruce trees where the first two hikers were found. Ivanov secretly believed that people in the trees had been shot at with heat-based weapons, and this is what killed them. Maybe a strange light form in the sky frightened the hikers out of their tents, but then forced them into a trance-like state, and they walked down the mountain. Once the hikers were away from their camp, the aliens could have killed them with their strange weaponry. In theory, this could explain both the bizarre injuries and the radiation that was found on the hiker's clothes. If it wasn't aliens, then perhaps it was some other type of dark spirit that inhabited the mountain. The number 9 is very interesting in this case. According to Mansi legends, 9 hunters were killed in mysterious and very gruesome circumstances hundreds of years earlier, and then in 1991, a plane carrying 9 people crashed into Dead Mountain and killed everyone on board. There is this theory called paradoxical undressing, which makes people who are actually suffering from hypothermia think that they're overheating and then undress in an effort to cool down. It's like the body's last resort to try and feel warm, and this could explain why some of the hikers were found in little more than their underwear in such intense conditions. Hypothermia is also known to cause paranoia, and this could have explained why they decided to flee the tent. But there are a few problems with this theory. For one, four of the hikers were found reasonably well-dressed, so clearly not everyone was suffering from this paradoxical undressing. Then there's the issue of the injuries. They don't even attempt to explain how the hikers sustained those, and for that reason, I can't seriously consider this a reasonable theory. Along similar lines, the area of the Dyatlov Pass is known to produce very low-frequency winds, which results in a phenomenon known as the Karman Vortex. The Karman Vortex is essentially a swirling pattern of air molecules that is known to cause panic attacks. I suppose this could have explained why they left the tent, but like the other one, it still doesn't explain the injuries. And besides all that, I think the main problem with any of the psychological theories is that they all assume that all nine members of the group responded in the same way, but that's not usually how psychological phenomena actually plays out in reality. A theory that seems quite a bit more likely to me is that some type of disagreement occurred between the hikers. Now, in such extreme circumstances, it doesn't seem unlikely that tempers could have boiled over. In the fight, maybe the tent got ripped open, but once the hikers were out in the cold, they realized their mistake and retreated into the trees in an effort to stay warm. Now, this would be a great explanation if it weren't for the severe injuries and both the radiation. And if you remember, doctors determined that many of the injuries couldn't have been caused by humans. Now, all of the theories I've talked about thus far have pretty substantial problems, but of all my research, what I'm about to tell you right now is by far the most compelling theory that I've been able to find on the topic. To me, one of the strangest things about this case is how hard the Soviet government fought to keep the details covered up. The autopsy reports were incredibly vague, and to this day, many details of the case are still secret. Clearly, the government was trying to hide something. We know for a fact that around this time in the 1950s, the Soviet government was big into testing nuclear weapons in remote areas like the Dyatlov Pass. Maybe in one of these weapons testings, the hikers were inadvertently harmed. Maybe the hikers heard some weird noise caused by the weapons, which scared them and caused them to flee the tent, and then the nuclear explosion would have explained the bizarre injuries and the radiation that was found in the area and on their clothes. And further to this point, it's a documented fact that nuclear rockets were fired towards Dead Mountain around the time when the expedition was happening. Now, of course, the scientists in charge of these tests claim that they couldn't have possibly reached that far, but maybe they were wrong. After all, the Soviets had only possessed nuclear weapons for about 10 years at this point, so it was still a relatively new and unknown technology. 
Now, there is of course no perfect theories. We'll likely never know what happened exactly on that horrific night, unless the Russian government decides to release some new information that breaks the case wide open. It will remain one of the greatest mysteries in history, and perhaps it's best that it stays that way, because the truth can be a very scary thing.